Hello designers and welcome back to another lecture for Art 166. Today we're going to talk about branding. That's a word you have probably heard a lot, even if you're not entirely sure what it means. So I'm not saying you don't know what it means, perhaps you do, but it is one of those words like a catchphrase. Um, so when I say brands, most people would probably think of this, this, or these, um, a logo. A logo is a visual symbol that represents a brand. But a logo itself is only part of what comprises a brand identity. Read this. Branding is about shaping perception about your product or your event. So when you go to the store, how do you decide what brand of toothpaste to use? You all pretty much do the same thing. Each brand has the same functional benefit, which is what we call um, what it does, more or less, uh, whitens teeth, provides fluoride, um, that sort of thing. But in addition to those tangible assets, a brand also has intangible assets. Uh, intangible assets are emotional benefits, the emotional associations that arise uh, from a product's brand identity, which is a result of the emotional tone of the advertising and the communities and in this case, celebrities who adopt a brand as part of their lives. So in a glutted and highly competitive market, let's go, I'm not going to go back, but imagine the image with all the different brands of toothpaste. How does your hand fall on that one um, box of Colgate or Crest or whatever you get? Well, part of that is whether you realize it or not, subconscious or not, or, or conscious, uh, it's often because of branding. It helps us differentiate one product from another. For example, the Starbucks brand is comprised of many things. The quality of Starbucks products, which is the reputation, what others share about the company on, say, social media, each person's unique experience with Starbucks, Starbucks community involvement or public relations, more or less, and finally, the logo, um, and any other visual elements, which together we call the brand identity. So together, these elements create the Starbucks brand. And how a brand is perceived changes from person to person. I mean, all of us have had different experiences with Starbucks, so our perception of the brand is not going to be the same, or any brand is not going to be the same. But when enough individuals arrive at the same gut feeling, an organization like Starbucks can be said to have a brand. So how are these intangible assets arrived at? In very simple terms, the brand strategy begins with what differentiates a product. What core characteristic or characteristics set it apart? What quality or position does the brand, quote, own that the competition doesn't? For example, Volvo owns safety. They are considered the safest car brand in the world. I, I don't even know that much about a Volvo, but I know that. Uh, I mean, I've never shopped for one, but they, they are the brand to beat when it comes to safety. They've spent millions and millions marketing themselves as the safest car. That's not to say they're not, um, they probably are, but that's, that's, their, their, that's the brand positioning that they own. That is the characteristic that sets them apart, and that is what they exploit in their branding. Whoops. So brand strategy outlines how they conceive, create, and position a brand within the marketplace in order to achieve differentiation, relevance, engagement with the viewer or the public, and resonance. That's just an example of one of their ads. Very straightforward. So Nike's Timeless and Classic Just Do It campaign equates Nike's products with greatness. This is a very simplified read that I'm getting, but beneath the various, uh, um, various compelling images and stories that Nike has used in their advertising, um, at the, beneath it all is that they are associating their brand with the prospect of achieving greatness. And the greatness can be greatness of spirit, in the case of Colin Kaepernick, or uh, one of the earliest um, uh, endorsements or the earliest um, icons they used was uh, Michael Jordan, and that was more about his performance on the basketball field. So it could be physical, spiritual, emotional, um, but it's some level of greatness. And that is, have, has, of course, expanded over the years. So let's stop for a second and ask yourself, what if we had no branding? How would we represent a product? 
we're so used to seeing logos all the time. Now when we think about Nike or um, Starbucks, or Volvo for that matter, it's pretty easy. You can show a picture of a car or a sneaker or a cup of coffee. You can simply use photography. But what about an insurance company? Besides, you know, falling asleep thinking about it, what comes to mind? On the surface, most companies, insurance companies, seem like faceless, vast corporate entities that look more like monotony than anything else. And they I mean, I'm not saying they all look like this, but they're all pretty much the same. So which distinguishes, what distinguishes one from the other? A brand. Without a visual identity, logo, or icon, almost any company or organization would seem like a generic group. I mean, all three of these insurance agencies do pretty much the same thing. And yet they each have a, a different um, brand story. So the basic purpose of a visual identity is to identify, differentiate, and build a sustainable presence and position that company within the marketplace as to engender trust in the public. Trust is very big when it comes to branding. With so many brands in each product and service category, it is a business imperative that each brand's identity communicates clearly and consistently consistently, 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 or consistency, consistency, consistency. That is a huge thing, and it's something that um, across all design, and you'll hear me hopefully preach it over and over again. Yeah, I have a whole big long thing to read there, but it's pretty boring, so I'm just going to keep going. You get the point. Geico. Okay, so designing a visual identity begins with the logo as the Quote there says, it's the point of entry to the brand. It's the keystone of any visual identity. Like I already said, it's a unique identifying symbol. Every time a viewer sees a logo for a brand, a group, or a social cause, the viewer should be able to immediately recognize and identify the entity, organization, product that it represents. So while a brand is more than the logo and other graphics, um, the logo is where it begins. So this is where, this is, I don't know if this was the very first MTV logo, but it's, it's, it's a pretty simple one. Let's just say that's where it began. And that's what it's grown into. It's grown from a logo into an overall visual identity, something that can be used on merchandise. It can be used in all mediums, um, television, online. Um, it can be adapted into just different looks to, to match the various products, whether it's MTV's MTV Classic or their reality television, um, that's growing the brand. This is a maritime museum in Australia that rebranded, I'm going to see quote recently, I'm not exactly sure how recent it was, but it's in the last five or ten years. Um, and uh, I think it's a great example of taking a logo and growing it out into a larger brand identity. So. This is a logo. You see it used, you know, in two colors there on the right, and then we also see, uh, you know, the, the the logo itself placed on top of an image, like it might be on, say, a website, for example. And here is a wall of posters. I think that's what they are. Um, like we used to see in New York a lot, um, just a series of the same poster. But it gives you a great view of an overview, rather, of the brand elements. There's obviously the logo, number one. Um, Number two, color palette. The same, there's the same group of colors. I'm not going to go through and enumerate them, but whether it's the coral or the chartreuse or the dark blue, those are used. There's probably about four or five colors that are used interchangeably, uh, um, and those colors are always used. So it create and that and color is a huge part of a brand. Um, use of photography. Most of these involve a half page or a full page large um, evocative image. Um, I almost going to say color, but we see a few monochromatic images in there as well. Um, placement, often in the smaller versions anyway, with the museum, and is always in the upper left-hand corner. Um, and that creates this consistency. The, the title, and if you look at the first two things, James Cameron, Challenging the Deep, and the next one, Gapu Monarch, Saltwater. Um, you can tell that they're, they're part of the same thing, they're part of the same family, and that's mostly because there is a consistent use of brand elements. Here's the back of their business cards. 
So these brand elements become the building blocks for any kind of design that they do. Um, amongst other things, it just sort of makes it easy. If someone says, well, I need an ad right away for your, your maritime museum and you haven't done an ad before, you're like, well, we already sort of have this look from our poster, so why don't we just take one of these and you know, put a message on it? So it does sort of, um, it's, it's a great jumping off point. You're not always starting from scratch. Holiday, summer holiday program, some banners, again, the, the palette is what really sticks out to me there. Merch. Oh, I got, oh, oh, look at me, I got animation. Schmancy. All right, I'm skipping that. Okay, so um, here's an example of a quote, again, recently redone brand for a baking company in uh, Finland. And in this case, the designers used, they looked back at the, um, we, I didn't go into what the maritime people did, why they chose that. I was just really more interested in showing you how a brand is built out. But we're also going to, in the next two lectures, talk about logos and like where do they come from and how do we start making them and what, what's a jumping off point for creating a logo. In this case, the, the this um, company is very proud of their um, history. They've been around, as the logo says, since 1694. So this designer decided to hearken back to that to, to um, encapsulate the client's origin, the fact that they've been around for, what is that, 350 years or so. Um, and that is incorporated into the look of this new brand. It's a contemporary sans serif font used for the name, and it contrasts with this more ornate, the B, which is has that more um, historical look. The pennant shapes um, recall, the kind of overall look recalls ancient banners from a time when this company was, was actually um, founded. Here's a few more examples of how that brand was grown through over various products. We see branding in books as well. I mean, you, if you took the Harry Potter name off these, you would know from book to book that these are Harry Potter books just because of the similarity of the illustrations. And when you have a coordinated strategy for the covers, it allows for things like color change and the t of course, the title of the books changes from, from each one, but the Harry Potter, the treatment of that stays consistent. So it's this balancing act of keeping some elements completely consistent, and then you can play around with other ones. Okay, I'm going to hold there for now, talking about branding, but we'll be coming back, um, it will be coming back into play more for your final project, Project 4, that we'll get into or we'll describe in the next few lectures, I think. Um, anyhow, Thank you for listening. Take the quiz, and I will talk to you all soon. Thanks.